Okay, we're back. We're live, 11 o'clock clock rock with life after statehood. And today we're going to talk about the condo craze with my co-contributor, Ray Tsuchiyama, informed citizen, and is he ever. Welcome back. Thank you, and I'm wearing my 1987 Wren's or Christmas shirt that I can <laughs> still <beautiful>. fit in <laughs> uh, from the year that I was married in uh, Honolulu. So uh, I, I take it out every, every uh, uh, December 1st and wear it through the month. <laughs> Amazing. So, so, so uh, I'm here with you uh, to discuss this very important topic. In uh, 1960 or so, uh, the, the law was passed. And uh, Hawaii was one of the first states that adopted a condominium law, uh, allowing a, a, what they called a horizontal property regime. And it was actually a vertical property regime, but <laughs> call it horizontal if you like, where you could buy space within a larger beehive kind of structure and you could own it. And that was different than what they had in New York, which was the co-op approach. Uh, management of the co-op is different than management of the condo. And management of the co-op is everybody is a partner in everything, and you only get a kind of lease arrangement with the with the the partnership to use that space. In Hawaii and other states with condos, and we were a leader, uh, you get to own it. You get to own those four walls, <clears throat> and it's very it's remarkable what happened because until then uh, everybody was in single family residences. Until then, uh, you know. The, the idea of multi-unit, multi-story buildings have not really taken off. Everything was really horizontal before then. 1960 or so, mm -hmm. as I recall. <clears throat> now, what was interesting about this, Ray, is that there, it was a coiled spring. All of a sudden, the people coming off the plantations, the people going into the professions, had a new, a new concept to play with. And they played. And they, and, and by the way, also at that time, there was a certain tax benefits to limited partnerships. Um, before that, I guess you would call them a hui or a tanamoshi. Right. Right. But after that, it was a limited partnership. And you would still call it a hui or a tanamoshi, but it had structure. And uh, the Internal Revenue Service allowed you to have benefits uh, in a limited partnership that way. And you could also set it up so you were a partner. <clears throat> but you were a limited partner, so it was like owning stock in a corporation. This was very attractive and a big incentive for people to be uh, limited partners and not have liability, or be general partners and have a lot of control. And it was really an incredible device. So that, taken together with the condominium law, and you have a fantastic confluence, and you have the people who would like to make some money, and so off they go to Makiki. And you can still see the product of their efforts with these small condo buildings, not well designed, not well situated, not well constructed, but there they are, they're still there, and that changed Makiki forever. <laughs> you know, people don't realize you, you build a condo, <clears throat> it's very hard to take it down. <laughs> there's, no, there's no specific provision in the law to take it down. Oh, and the third thing that happened, and I'll turn this over to you, okay. The third thing that happened is the notion of leasehold. Mm. Because all of a sudden, you know, thanks to, I guess, the Bishop of State, it wasn't yet known as KSBE, thanks to the Bishop of State, we, we kind of invented the notion of leasing your property. Uh, we, we, invent, we, we had it from uh, single family residences in, in Kahala, for example, um, leasing your property rather than owning your property. So these smart guys, building condos would lease the land to the condo association and your unit would last, you know, traditionally 55 years. After that, um, there was a provision in the lease that said, thank you very much for paying us the lease rent for the last 55 years. Now you must demolish the building and take it away. <clears throat> I don't think that has ever, ever happened, but that was in a lot of those leases. So the combination of those things right after statehood changed residential living. Talk about it. Well, uh, going back to 1959, uh, you, if you go to Waikiki, you go walking uh, beyond the zoo and the beautiful area by the Elks Club, there are co-ops, as you know. San Susi, Tahitian, um, many co-ops in that area. And it's a different world. Uh, and that was uh, where um, a, maybe a, a building of uh, uh, 20 units, 30 units, uh, barely 11 stories were built. 
Again, for mainland investors or people who spent a month or two in Hawaii coming from California to the West Coast. So the co-ops are in Hawaii, uh, uh, pattern after New York laws and so forth. 5960, you see manifest destiny actually because the condominium laws and so forth were not uh, uh, developed on the thin air. They came from somewhere else, California. Mm -hmm. California had a huge building boom uh, in the post-war period. People flocked to LA, San Francisco, a lot to LA area, and San Diego, working in the uh, war industries there for uh, manufacturing of aircraft, guns, uh, radar, uh, um, aerospace. So they developed the whole condominium regime, all those laws and so forth. So as a adopt of those laws that were developed. Uh, they were just coming over to Hawaii at that point. But you have a very good point about, uh, again, uh, the tax laws also. Now, 5960, you have uh, veterans of 442nd and so forth. They had some cash. Uh, they were great savers. I mean, Japanese, Americans, and Chinese, and Koreans are great savers. They had money you know, in the banks, uh, under the bed. Uh, I mean, uh, they, they, were, they had money to uh, spend, uh, or invest, rather. And you're correct about the Tanomoshi Wahuis, and uh, they began to band together. And they knew each other. They knew each other from high school, from elementary school, even from kindergarten. But they trusted each they other. They trusted each other, and it was not a bank thing. Remember, if you go back in time, uh, each bank it was a, a kind of an ethnic bank. Uh, you know, CPB, Central Pacific Bank, was a Japanese bank. Hawaii uh, National <laughs> Bank, a Chinese that's bank. That's right. Uh, so uh, it was hard to go to Bank of Hawaii if you weren't uh, a, a castle or a cook or <laughs> a bishop. <laughs> I mean, it was hard to get a loan from First Hawaiian uh, or the, the banks that before. So there were ethnic banks at that point. But even the ethnic banks were uh, reluctant to loan to uh, uh, people uh, who uh, you know uh, were working class uh, people uh, uh, working for the big five or plantations or small mom and pops at that stage? You're correct. So and the 442nd uh, again that uh, bonding also was a was a key. Uh, they were still meeting each other every month for uh, lunch or dinner. They were still going to the same. Um, uh, you know, diners and so forth. So that that was a very interesting uh, um, uh, they were investment in their 40s. view. They were young, that's they right. Were in their 40s. Yeah, that's right. Uh, around the slavery, they were just at the primary of the life, primary of the life, raising their children, and they wanted to uh, go ahead. Uh, the, the other thing uh, that you mentioned uh, interesting is, uh, of course, um, uh, leasehold. Now, uh, there's two. Uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, there's a contrarian view about leasehold, uh, and leasehold really developed in the post-war period, and it was a, a way to allow for business to allocate uh, uh, capital, which they didn't have much, to, uh, uh, and not to buy a uh, piece of property to put their manufacturing plant or their gas station or whatever, and to reserve it and then invest in machine tools or, you know, playing uh, for people and so, so forth. It was a way at that time uh, to really get small business started. Th that's another contrarian view. Now, if you look at leasehold in the residential real estate world, there were a leasehold before, especially in, say, the UK. There were leases for 100 years, 200 years, I mean, uh, historically and so forth. Mm -hmm. But you're correct look that... Look at Hong Kong. Yeah, uh, right, yeah, there's long leaseholds uh, there. Uh, now, what, what happened in Hawaii uh, was uh, uh, unusual because, of course, we're on an island and much of the land is owned by larger states. So they had an overwhelming leverage for, uh, against the small person uh, and they could dictate terms. They wouldn't sell. They <laughs> yeah. wouldn't sell you. Uh, why would they uh, you know, uh, sell their only asset, which was, which was land, as opposed to uh, the, uh, the continental U.S. There was land all over the place. And if you didn't like it, you could move. But you couldn't move in, in, in Honolulu. They had to take w what they had to get. And in fact, the early, very early um, uh, developments like Hawaii Kai was, again, Bishop Estate, at least all by Henry Kaiser. But, he, but again, a large a community could not be developed without a large one parcel, a huge parcel to develop. Now, the good flip side of the good side of that is that there were planned communities that, that developed, like Milani by Castle and Cook. But you could see already there, uh, Castle and Cook had an advantage, or Amfac or many other uh, companies had an advantage over other uh, developers in that they owned the land. And it was it was taxed at agricultural rates <laughs> before they could, again, uh, 
uh, converted, church, converted uh, uh, to uh, be, uh, you know, uh, to uh, R1, uh, BMX1 or whatever, whatever. But it was a long time to do get to that point, as you know. Uh, well, Castle and Cook's first project in Milani took 40 years yeah. from the beginning <laughs> to actual right. to finishing the project. So uh, even though you owned the land, it took you were in a, uh, a conundrum because you had to like invest and 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 uh, all that time and and uh, resources to get to a point before you even built the first house, and that of course added to the price of the house. Right. <laughs> and not the, and of course, the land itself is so uh, expensive that in many times, that's why uh, uh, you don't tear it down or you try to renovate because if you tear, tore it down and started from, uh, uh, from scratch, it, it just uh, exponentially increases the, the construction. Permitting and all yeah, that. Yeah, so uh, to build a new it house. forever. So and as you say, time yeah. is money. That's right. So, so there, there's all these confluences that happened uh, again on an island. But you bring up a little interesting point about uh, Hong Kong. Now, uh, Hong Kong and Singapore are also islands, and their experiences in the 60s and 70s, uh, starting from that uh, period, was to uh, take over land as the government and build, uh, uh, you know, uh, what we would call condominiums, but about apartment houses. And and as people began to get higher salaries, they got to uh, buy their own place, but they were uh, allocated in a kind of a kind of a master planned way, so they would just release a little bit of land here, a little bit of land here, and then and then uh, and then build them. So people had the opportunity to live in their own apartment. So it was and a, own it and own it, even though it was not forever. That's right. But there was it was a uh, kind of a planned out kind of thing. And of course here there was no plan. <laughs> Something happened in Makiki, which was a tremendous like a wild Wild West. It was something like Oklahoma, <laughs> and people came in and then began to do this uh, without any thinking, except to make a very short-term uh, profit. Yes, right. Exactly right. Those limited partnerships would be, would they try to uh, hold, do the whole deal as quickly as possible, and take the money and run. That's that's what it was. There was no lingering interest. Sell all the units, get out not be a, a member of the condominium association. The developers would be gone and they'd have a, a bag of money for their efforts. The other thing is there was plenty of intrigue, <laughs> plenty of shenanigans that went on in these condos. Um, it was sometimes it was not a pretty picture. Uh, there was litigation among the partners, among the members of the limited partnership. Uh, there'd be litigation with the contractor. And of course, the traditional litigation that followed construction construction litigation with the construction contractor. It was a lawyer's delight <laughs> <laughs> for a long time. A lot of legal work, you right. know. I think it, in those years, maybe the 10, 20 years that followed 1960, it's a lot of legal work all around condos. Um, and it came of age, though. It came of age in that period. For example, uh, the way you handled a condo board, uh, the way the board members uh, wrote their bylaws, uh, the way they manage, the way they manage their managing agent. There was a whole industry uh, that right. came up around condos. Cheney Brooks and right. Company was management a good example. Association, uh, management companies. Management again, companies. Yeah, were, 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 yeah and, they would, and they would send um, you know, managers down, I mean, their managers down to your condo right. board meeting. Uh, there was a whole new industry in, in the managing, uh, managing person, the condo manager person who managed the condo, sometimes lived in the condo in, in a unit there. Uh, there were insurance firms that, that, that made their bones selling condo insurance. There were contractors by the carload that made their bones painting, repairing, uh, upgrading condos. I mean, it's been a huge industry for a while. Well, what you just uh, said, to, uh, uh, said in, in a nutshell, it created an entirely uh, new ecosystem <laughs> of, of companies and lawyers and, and inspection and uh, property managers, and it, it became a whole world uh, that now did not exist in 1959. Uh, but because of these l new laws and, and investment vehicles, um, th there was uh, new jobs created also. Uh, and uh, the condominium associations uh, began to flourish as, as small bodies and, and replaced what became what was the neighborhood. Yeah. We're going to take a minute now, Ray. 
Ray Tsuchiyama, uh, my uh, co-contributor and co-conspirator here, a life after statehood, uh, and we're talking about the condo craze in Hawaii uh, after statehood. Very interesting. We'll be right back. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you excited about my new show, which is called Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond, and it's going to be on Think Tech Hawaii from downtown Honolulu on Tuesday afternoons, 5 p.m. And we're going to talk about uh, to make architecture more inclusive on the islands, which is what hu which is one of the definitions of humane, which is being tolerant of uh, you know many people of nature of many other influences. So we're gonna have some great guests, like today's guest, for example, uh, my collaborator, David Rockwood, who is the author of the awesome um, manifestation of uh, humane architecture in the background. So see you on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. I look forward to. Okay, we're back. We're live with Ray Tsuchiyama. We're talking about the condo craze here on Life After Statehood on ThinkTech. So somewhere along the line, my best guesstimate would be around 1980, instead of having little wee, you know, four-story condos in Makiki, which were, which, you know, re rebuilt Makiki, used to be all single family and big lots. Now it, uh, people made a lot of money assembling those lots or, or actually not assembling them take a little wee lot and make a little wee condo and bag pulls of money because it'd be worth much more uh, if you sold, you know, 10 or 15 units or 20 units on the same space used to be one single family house. But somewhere along the line, um, it got bigger. And there got to be some iconic condos in much more expensive neighborhoods than Makiki. You remember the ones? Well, one is, uh, of, of course, in Waikiki, Yan Harbor Towers that uh, sprung up in the 70s. Stark. Uh, Stark, yes, uh, and uh, Sherry Ying. Uh, uh, and uh, that is iconic because they faced the ocean. Views became uh, prominent in, uh, as a criteria for, uh, for marketing uh, condominiums, uh, very much so. And uh, so, so th that would, uh, uh, if you fast forward that to um, uh, the uh, Wana Ala Moana and others in Kakako, uh, the Nauru Tower, that which appeared about in the uh, 80s, mid 80s, and so forth, um, and that led to Mo Moana Pacific and, and others around that area. But the one that uh, was goes way back is 1350 Ala Moana, and, and that's by uh, Ala Moana Center. Menifee, uh, you Menifee. Yeah, and and that was you know now. Um, it looks ancient. It looks very ancient compared to the glass. Great location. Uh, yeah, the location is everything. Location, location, location is everything for 1350. And the others are, are prominent along Alamona uh, Boulevard. And uh, they begin appearing, uh, Narua and Yan Harbor and others, just before the uh, great uh, Japanese investment boom. And, uh, and they became uh, synonymous with, uh, with not only uh, living in a luxurious style, but also as branding that uh, you own the condo in Waikiki. And uh, uh, of course, Waikiki began to uh, also uh, uh, develop, especially in uh, condo tells and like the Trump Towers and Rich Carlton's. Nobody makes a, just a purely hotel anymore. <laughs> they sell it to investors for time sharing, as you know. Time share and yeah, condos. Yeah, and well, condos. So, so it's, it's a <laughs> mixture now. You, you spoke of the Ilikai. Well, right. the Ilikai, one building of the Ilikai, the one on the other side. Right. It's all condo. That's right. In fact, the, the one on the, uh, the Diamond Head side is condo too. Right. It's a condo hotel. So, I mean, condo was, was like going everywhere. Uh, Alamona Hotel. Uh, Alamona so, Hotel, so yeah. that was, and, and I think um, it goes back to what you just said. Um, it, as a developer, uh, when you uh, go through the permitting process and all the construction and so forth, uh, the objective is getting your money back as quickly as possible. We have no idea what's going to happen afterwards in the market. And you spend all that time investment with no income. You just totally no, with no income. So uh, it's, it's better to uh, condomize or, you know, to get money up front to, uh, uh, and to sell out as quickly as possible because who knows what the market will be in two or three years. And so uh, you're, uh, you're correct. Even in Waikiki, the uh, revenue stream of a hotel room over several years, you can am amortize that and so forth. But to uh, sell as a condominium, you get money immediately. So that, that is the objective. Now. Yeah, and get out. Get out. Uh, yes, hang just, yeah, just get out. <laughs> 
Yes. But you do the math. I mean, the land itself is going to be worth X dollars. A single family residence or a series of them going to be X plus dollars. But a condo, right. especially a fee symbol condo, is going to be worth huge amounts of money. And the idea is to, um, you know, have, have the revenue, there's the sales revenue from that, right. well exceed any construction costs. And a lot of people did. They made a lot of money making condo. You know, and it's not just the luxuries, the big ones, say, going, you know, um, west from, from town, starting in IAEA and working their way all the way down through Pearl City, lots of big condos. And condos in town, a lot of condos came up in town. And these, these were for ordinary people, oh, yeah, right, right. middle class people. Right. They'd have to beg, borrow, and steal to raise the money. They'd have to take big loan, 90% loans. And they did. And for a time, you know, when developers were straddled on this kind of thing, they would sell it to you cheap. Uh, and they would, they would finance it for right. you and make it easy. Right. <clears throat> so we wound up with a whole bunch of uh, middle class condos all over right. Oahu and the neighbor islands where people would naturally move to. Um, it's easier in a way to live in a condo than a single family residence. You just pay your maintenance fee and, uh, and everything is taken care of for you. You have to worry about security. Um, so it's a convenience. It's, it's a, a convenience, convenience factor. Location. And, and uh, you're correct that uh, for many people uh, who uh, lived in this, uh, uh, residences in, in town uh, during the 60s and 70s, began to go out to uh, the suburbs, Pearl City, um, uh, Kapolei, uh, Soda Creek, Gentry, way out there during vast the 80s, and, 80s and 90s. And then we entered the 2000s. People are coming back into town. Their children have grown up. Uh, they just would need a place for their dog and, and uh, their couple. Couple, and and uh, people are coming back into it. There also, um, there's a, a segment of, of a population who are coming in and uh, they don't have any children. They, they want to have an urban experience. And again, this is linked to mass transit, though. Uh, if, if, and, and the other reason why people move back into town is that they just cannot stand the commute uh, from, yeah, right. from, uh, uh, from the west coming into the east. Uh, so, so you have a, a group of people who uh, also would uh, like to be in town without a car, but there is an efficient mass transit. And so th the argument goes back to why did we begin outside of uh, no <laughs> outside when again, if we had a series of stops within within Alamana downtown, you know, Kalihi and so forth, that uh, urban corridor, that would be the starter. And that would have brought people back into town to live in condos and then um, have a more vibrant neighborhood feeling. Yeah, what we lost out is we, we built condos everywhere. And there were no green belts to speak of. And uh, now, uh, uh, funny, we hardly remember his name, but Neil Abercrombie talked about building high-rise condos, really high-rise, two high-rise condos in the center of the city in Kaka'ako. Um, because, you know, you have to do that if you have limited space. But we could have planned it a lot better. Now we, we have condo sprawl in every direction. But what I wanted to get to you, uh, get with you is, is on the Japanese investment thing. It happened in the Japanese time, and that would have been uh, 1980 to 90, roughly. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it started in the, uh, about 83, 84, and then would uh, continue into the early 90s. So yeah. when, they, when they first started buying condos, and they did, uh, they bought uh, middle-class condos. But then, you know, condo developers could see there was really a benefit in trying to go trophy condos. And location meant a lot, but fancy, uh, you know, fancy, fancy buildings meant a lot. Lots of amenities meant a lot, <clears throat> and they were going to be used as retreats in which the owners did not live, maybe rented, maybe not, um, and they would come here from time to time and use the place. And all of a sudden, we, we went to extravagance, and now we had condos, and this is really important if we're examining, you know, life after statehood. Now, condo became synonymous with fancy, expensive, uh, extravagant condos. And it happened a long time ago. This is you know, 35 years ago. But all of a sudden, you saw these really expensive condos going up, condos that you and me would really not be interested in, um, condos that local people could not afford, being sold off to investors from offshore. What kind of effect did that have? Well, uh, it effect in several ways. Uh, number one, um, I think developers found out 
that um, uh, if you put a slightly more expensive material, you could exponentially uh, sell the condo uh, value would go up. Uh, it would also uh, position Hawaii as a uh, play, uh, as a location for uh, the super rich. I mean, uh, th that's another uh, uh, place. And uh, it goes back in time to what Hawaii tourism was before the war, which was one segment, which was the very high uh, wealthy uh, segment uh, of the population and not the middle uh, middle and so forth. But uh, to be uh, frank, uh, there is still a huge uh, population of middle class visitors coming to Hawaii who are kind of uh, outside that kind of zone of uh, wealthy and, and, and um, uh, condo investors and so forth. Uh, however, going back to Waikiki and, and the condo, uh, uh, condos that are uh, in that area, again, limited area. And if, even if you have a, uh, so if you buy, build a condo which, uh, with the same type of materials, maybe a slightly better, you know, slightly bar, uh, uh, more marble, a developer's choice is go luxury rather than middle. Because there's more, uh, money. Yeah, there's more money. That's why you have Burger Kings leaving Kalakaua to, uh, uh, for uh, Max Mara or Louis Vuitton and so forth, because per square foot, you can make so much more money. <laughs> And so forth. So it, it, that that change in in retail and and uh, real estate uh, is is a uh, one that's not uh, focused just on uh, on buyers and condos. I think it's it's kind of a um, uh, emblematic of yeah. the whole and the kind of whole, part of it. Yeah, part of of the change transformation yeah. of Waikiki. Yeah, yeah. It's like uh, the Palm Court phenomenon. You know, we we want well healed investors here we want to build well you know high high rate high high value right. um, condos for them we want to offer them high value stores we know they're from they're not from here we know that the local middle class isn't going to shop there or live there but we do it anyway because it's it's part of raising money for investors and then you find the investors are from offshore too and then you wonder exactly what does this mean for us um, the investors are from offshore uh, the people who buy that stuff they're from offshore. People who buy retail offshore. Everybody, every, it's like having an offshore phenomenon right in our midst, except we can't really participate in, in it. <clears throat> and then you have, uh, we don't have a minute left here, but then we have, you know, the latest and greatest in Kaka'ako. We have in Kaka'ako condos that routinely go for two, three million dollars. And in fact, there's one penthouse there in one particular building that recently sold for $95 million. They were asking 100. Um, <clears throat> and we're talking about prices that would never, never be, uh, you know, within the reach of local people. And so it, the, now the condo has gone to a completely different place in the economy and the residential hierarchy. Um, this, nobody in the state could ever afford it. So we are selling to the most well-heeled people in the world. Uh, it, 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 it's, it stands a parallel to, you know, London and New York and whatever, uh, as, a, as a, the, the cost of living there. <clears throat> and this has also an effect. Um, so I don't think, it, you know, there are condos being built that are middle class, but I don't think they hold a candle to these huge condos. Dr drive down Ala Moana, one after the other, block after block. Uh, building after building, they are very expensive. We talk about affordable housing, but that's a small part of it, and it's not very affordable. Uh, in reality, we are building luxury condos in the best locations of the city, and this is changing our quality of public public spaces. You know? Well, uh, historically, uh, the state uh, and the city has has attempted uh, to address uh, public housing. Also, Mayor Wrights. Uh, was before the war. KPT, Kuya Park uh, Terrace, was you know early 60s, mid 60s. Both really didn't uh, address the issues uh, or deteriorated through time. Uh, and and whether the state uh, could have planned it out better, uh, um, uh, kind of thing. 
And you're correct that the green belts are gone. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the sugar is, is gone, but still that opened up for more housing. Uh, it, uh, and, and, you know, what if we use the sh uh, former sugar lands as agriculture to sustain, you know, a kind of urban uh, lifestyle in, in, in uh, downtown and so forth? Uh, I, but again, I, I think how the developers uh, transformed Kakako was uh, that they saw an opportunity to uh, really um, uh, uh, create new spaces outside of Waikiki that didn't exist in Waikiki. You can't build big things anymore in Waikiki. There isn't much space. Yeah, in the end, it's market-driven, investment-driven. But why do I feel, Ray, that you and I can never actually finish our conversation? <laughs> because we, we, we raise issues and think of things we never thought of before, and uh, we'll just have to keep on trying. That's Ray Tsuchiyama. All right. We co-contribute. Right. On Life After Statehood, today, the condo craze. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you. Aloha. All right.